Let me start with a short prayer from the Upanishads and then we'll get into the subject. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om lead us from the unreal to the real lead us from darkness unto light lead us from death to immortality Om peace 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 Good morning everyone and thank you for having me here uh, to the organizers I owe a special uh, debt of gratitude for putting this program together. Uh, pranams to revered Swamiji Shankaranji who is present here. Um, the subject that we have this morning is it's called the secret of Om. So I'll get into that eventually but first let me say what a wonderful place Sedona is. Um, I come from the Vedanta Society of New York. Swami Vivekananda was uh, the person who really brought Vedanta to the West in 1893 in the World Parliament of Religions. And in 1894, the very next year, he started the first Vedanta Society in New York. So that's where I'm coming from right now. And it's closed in summer. So the monk there travels in summer, giving talks in different parts of the United States. When people knew that I'm going to come to Sedona, they, everybody kept telling me, oh, you'll love it. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. And I was thinking, it's a desert. What, how, how, how good could it be? I didn't say anything to anybody, not to hurt their feelings. But, but then when we just entered Sedona, it was remarkable. It's magical. And I was thinking, how lucky you people are who stay here. You know, you tend to get used to a place when you stay there. You have to see it with fresh eyes, with the kids' eyes, or you're seeing it for the first time. So it's beautiful. It's magnificent, it's magical, and it's spiritual. I sensed it immediately. People have told me, maybe a little bit of conditioning working there, but people have told me that it's spiritual, but I do sense it. I almost, it was almost like crossing a barrier. As you enter the precincts of this area, you feel the vibration here. So yes, I do believe that there are special places, special times, which uh, I won't say they are more spiritual than others, but they seem to channel or manifest spirituality more than others. That is true. Uh, it's more manifest in certain places. Sedona, I believe, is one of them. So once again, I'm very happy to be here with all of you. The subject I want to speak about here today is Vedanta. Um, not many, so many people know about it, especially if you are spiritual, um, if you are new agey in any way. Um, though I find many people in the West, in, a, in the United States and in Europe, they think uh, Vendata? Is it the Vendata Society or something? <laughs> Vedanta comes from the Vedas, the word Vedas, which is the most ancient <laughs> scriptures of the Hindus. In the Vedas, towards the end of these Vedas, the final teachings of the Vedas, Vedanta literally means the end of the Veda. Anta is end and Veda is the, the, the uh, revealed scriptures. So the final teachings or the highest teachings in that sense and sometimes literally towards the end of the body of texts called the Vedas you find these texts called Upanishads and uh, these Upanishads are the root texts of Vedanta. In fact if you look for a philosophy of Hinduism you would come to Vedanta. There are many many schools of Vedanta the Upanishads have been interpreted by masters through the ages. Um, the one I will speak about, the one I represent, is called uh, Advaita Vedanta. And the Swami there also comes from the same lineage. So Advaita Vedanta is non-dual Vedanta. And um, it is based on, uh, a significant figure there is Shankaracharya, where again, the Swami's name Shankarananda comes from. Uh, Shankara also means Shiva, one of the forms in which God is worshipped in Hinduism. Shankaracharya lived about 1400 years ago in the south of India and he selected 
10 or some say 11 of these Upanishads to write commentaries. So basically non-dual Vedanta is overwhelmingly based on these 11 Upanishads. And among these Upanishads, there is one, the smallest among them, perhaps, not perhaps, the most powerful among them, is, it's called the Mandukya Upanishad. Um, it has only 12 mantras, you know, the texts, only 12, it will fit, uh, fit into an A4 size paper if you write it down. And yet it's the most powerful. In uh, Bengali, which is an Indian language, they talk about, you know, Indians like hot food, spicy food. So there are these small chilies which are really, really hot. In Bengali, they call it Dhani Lanka, <laughs> which means a tiny chili which is really hot. This Mandukya Upanishad is like that. In the ancient Indian story of Rama, Sita, Rama, Ramayana, so there's a nice story where Rama's dedicated devotee, Hanuman, who comes in the form of a huge monkey. Um, so uh, Hanuman asks Rama, uh, how do I get liberation, freedom, uh, um, salvation, whatever you call it, moksha in, uh, in Sanskrit. And Rama says, the Mandukya Upanishad is sufficient by itself for those who seek liberation. Mandukyam ekam eva alam mumukshunam vimukta. That's the original Sanskrit. The Mandukya Upanishad, the that text, is enough by itself to confer liberation upon those who seek it. And then he goes on to say, suppose you go through the Mandukya Upanishad and you still don't get it, you're still not enlightened. Then Rama gives a syllabus of 108 Upanishads. So I think that's a good incentive to become liberated with this one Upanishad. <laughs> and this one Upanishad, the Mandukya Upanishad, tiny in itself, um, it's a very powerful text. Nowadays, if you read the text, it comes embedded in a larger text called the Mandukya Karika, literally meaning verses on the Mandukya Upanishad. So Shankaracharya's Guru's Guru, his master's master, Gaudapada, he wrote uh, a commentary in verse form on the Mandukya Upanishad. He included the Mandukya Upanishad in the first chapter of this book, four chapters. First chapter includes the Mandukya Upanishad, and then Gaudapada wrote um, about 215 verses on this original text, which has only 12 mantras. So that's it. That gives you the background of <coughs> the source where I'm going to take this from, what I'm going to talk about this morning. Why is it called the secret of Om, the subject today? If there is one mantra, one sacred uh, sound which is um, overwhelmingly the symbolic of the divine, it is Om. In all the sacred traditions of India, Hinduism is wildly diverse. I often, I sometimes am called upon to introduce Hinduism to school children or college students in their religion courses. And I say that uh, it's difficult to summarize Hinduism because any question that you ask of Hinduism, the answer is always yes and no. <laughs> Do Hindus believe in God? Yes and no. Is God with form? Yes and no. Is God male? Yes and no. <laughs> God is male and female and beyond uh, gender and so on. So all of these forms. Uh, of Hinduism, but one thing common to all of them, among the few things that are common, one thing common to all of them is they all revere Om, the mantra Om. Not just Hindus, the Buddhists, all the different flavors Buddhism comes in, Om is uh, regarded as the highest mantra. Um, for example, the Tibetan Buddhist mantra Om Mani Padme Hung, so there's Om there. The Jain traditions, it's less, not very well known in the, in the West. That's another strand of, uh, another, another religion in India, which is actually like an older contemporary of Buddhism. They also revered Om. The youngest of the religions of India, Sikhism, the Sikhs, mm -hmm. the, their word term for the absolute is Ik Omkar, <laughs> the one Om that stands for the transcendent. So anyway, I have sold you on the importance of Om. And as you would expect, 
with this wide diversity of traditions and philosophies and views, you will expect a wide diversity of interpretation of Om. What does it mean? And so many, many meanings have been given. Om stands for the, the trinity of Hinduism, you know, Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara, the creator, the preserver, the destroyer, and many, many meanings. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is the classic manual for meditation, it says the name of God is Om. That's Tasya Vachaka Pranava. That's a sutra. It says the name of God is Om, or the highest name, name of God is Om, and so on. Even Time magazine got in on the act. There was a, I remember many years ago, there was a cover story on meditation, but the story start, I mean, the cover page had Om on it. <laughs> now the deepest and the most ancient interpretation of Om in the Upanishads you can find is in the Mandukya Upanishad. In fact, the Mandukya Upanishad, which we are going to speak about today, is built around Om. So today I'm going to talk about that. The highest teachings of Hinduism in the Vedanta and the Vedanta in its most concentrated form. You find it in the Mandukya Upanishad and the essence of the Mandukya Upanishad is Om. All right. I still haven't started. How am I doing for time? Okay. <laughs> Good. I'll speak for a while, introduce you to it, and then we will interact. You can ask questions. What the Mandukya Upanishad says is um, all Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, can be summarized in the statement that thou art. In Sanskrit, Tattvamasi. The basic insight of all Vedanta, it's a vast literature, but it can be expressed, easily expressed in one sentence. Is there's one thing that you take away from this talk, it would be this. You are that. What do you mean by that? That absolute, the ultimate reality, what we are seeking for, we are that. Uh -huh. but, there, but then the question comes, if we are that, then why don't we know it? <laughs> If I talk about a God or a divinity, who is in heaven? You, if you ask, why can't I see God? I'm safe. I'll say, because, because God is not here. God is in heaven, some other place. But if God is here, or that ultimate reality, whatever you talk about is here, then the question, there's a valid question. Why don't I experience it if it is right here? If I ask the question, when is God? And if the answer is after, after death, then again I'm safe because you'll have to die and go to heaven and then you see God. Why can't you see God now? Because it's not now, it's then. Not here, there, not now, then, then the teacher is safe. <laughs> if you go there and then and then you don't find God, you can't catch me anymore. It's too late. <laughs> but Vedanta claims that absolute reality which Vedanta calls Brahman and the word Brahman, not Brahmin. Brahman is a priestly class in India. Brahman means, literally it means the vast. The Sanskrit derivation, if you go to the root, it means that which expands. So the vast, literally the limitless. So that absolute, if I claim it's here, it's now, and it is you, then you have a legitimate question. That doesn't seem like, like, like it. I don't feel very absolute. I don't feel like the transcendent. I don't feel very godly. So the whole question comes, if you're claiming that, then prove it, show it, let me see what you mean. And that's what the uh, Mandukya Upanishad does with Om. It says, what religions call God is our own real self. Look at the words real self. By that, it immediately implies that we do not know what we are. Swami Vivekananda, when he came here more than 100 years ago, uh, he would, uh, Swami Vivekananda was the disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna was probably one of the most significant figures of Hinduism in the recent times. Now, Swami Vivekananda would say, if only you knew what you are. He would often tell his disciples in America in the late 19th century, if only you knew what you are, that thou art. The... Vedantic texts express this essential teaching in sentences called great sentences or profound sentences. In Sanskrit, Mahavakya. 
Maha, maha means great. Vakya means sentence. Great sentences not in the sense of long sentences. There are a lot of those in Sanskrit. They go on and on. They can fill up uh, literally a page with one sentence. But great in the sen these sentences are very short, usually two or three words. Um, four of them, and they all mean the same thing. It literally means you and God are one. You are the divine. So the most famous of these great sentences, it's already pretty well known in the West also. It's Tattvamasi, that thou art. Uh, it's from one of the Upanishads called the Chandogya Upanishad. Another one is also not as well known, meaning the same thing. Aham Brahmasmi, it's from the Brihadarnik Upanishad. It literally means I am the absolute, I am Brahman, the absolute. <laughs> Another one is there, Pragyanam Brahma, it's from the Aitiriya Upanishad. It means this awareness which we feel right now, what you're feeling now. If you understood it, what it was, that is the absolute. This awareness is the absolute. Pragyanam Brahma. And the last of the four great sentences, I am Atma Brahma. This very self, I am means pointing towards yourself. This Atma self, Brahma, is the absolute. And this last was sentence, this self is the absolute, I am Atma Brahma, is actually from the Mandukya Upanishad, the one which I'm going to talk about today. That's all I want to say about the text itself. Now we will dive into Om. What does it mean? Here's the deal. <laughs> the Mandukya Upanishad has its, what I said just now applies is to the general Advaita Vedanta philosophy. Now the peculiar technique adopted in the Mandukya Upanishad, it's a technique of the three states of awareness. Now the three states of our mind. What do you mean by the three states of our mind? It's something that we experience every day and we pay no attention to it. We are experiencing it right now. What are the three states? Waking, dreaming and sleeping. Dreaming is also in sleep, so we can put it in this way. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep. These are the three experiences which we have in common all our lives. Every day we, have, we, we are awake right now. Hopefully, because Vedanta has a way of putting people to sleep. <laughs> Waking, and then we fall asleep. And we dream, dreaming. And then there is, there is dreamless sleep, deep sleep. And then we wake up again, or we go into dreams. So these three keep cycling, and that's the story of our lives. And the Upanishad, Manduki Upanishad, makes this radical claim. You don't need anything else. All you need to do is take a closer look at your daily life and the absolute Brahman, the ultimate reality, your own reality is right there. Discover it and you get immortality. You, you are free. You know the prayer we did just now, lead us from darkness to light, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from death to immortality. Those results, you get the real, you get the light, you get immortality, freedom from uh, death. Not in the body. The body is still going to go to its inevitable um, conclusion. But you realize that you are this immortal existence. Great promise. Uh, what you call moksha, what is called moksha in Hinduism, nirvana in Buddhism, uh, um, salvation or whatever you call it in different religions. That is attained. It is attainable. Vedanta in fact claims it is already attained. You don't know it. Uh, that is discovered when you investigate waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. That's why uh, one of the things why I, I like Advaita so much. You see, if you take conventional religion, it depends heavily on faith. It starts with faith. There is God, and you do these things, and then you get freedom uh, or salvation. It, it's, this is what is called the path of bhakti, devotion. It's, it's based on faith. If you, don't, if you are skeptic, if you are Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens, it won't work. Because it's, you can't start with questioning. The path of devotion starts with faith. You have to have some kind of faith. The, the path of yoga is a path of experience, not faith. The path of yoga says to you, Patanjali Yoga for example, faith is not so important. What is important is do these things, these practices, these techniques of meditation, sit like this, breathe like this, meditate like this. Eventually you will have certain specific mystical experiences 
extraordinary experiences called various samadhis which will prove to you the truth of religion, of spirituality. Do you see the difference between the yogic approach and the devotional approach? The yogic approach is more of an experiential approach. It doesn't really matter what you believe or do not believe. What matters is have you had these experiences which prove to you the truth of religion? And it's very, very appealing for our modern age because we want proof. And Vivekananda, he, he, was, uh, he made waves when he came here at the end of 19th century and he said, religion is not belief, religion is realization. You actually have to realize God, you actually have to experience God. Advaita goes a step further. Not belief, not extraordinary experience, rather ordinary experience. We will investigate into ordinary experience which we all have, everybody has it. No matter what you believe, whether you practice meditation or not, does not matter. Ordinary experience which we already have, we will investigate that and the absolute God, whatever you call it, will be revealed to us. So what an incredible claim. But you'll have to follow the chain of reasoning, understand and then apply the understanding to what you are already experiencing. It will be revealed. All right. Big claim. <laughs> What's the word? Put your money where your mouth, uh, <laughs> mouth is, yeah. And Americans, they're very practical people, so they have a number of phrases for this, where the rubber hits the road, <laughs> walk the talk. Uh, yes, these are the terms. All right, so I'm going to do that now. It's very direct. It's subtle, but very, very direct, immediate almost. What the Upanishad, the peculiar technique of the Mandukya Upanishad is waking, dreaming, deep sleep. It says, what it says is, consider the waking experience, then the dream experience, then the deep sleep experience. What happens in the waking experience is, in you the consciousness, you are aware, we are all sentient, we are all aware, we are all conscious. In consciousness, we see, we experience a body, senses, and a mind is active. Look, already the language is a little different from what we, we normally, the way we describe it. We describe it as, I am this guy, so we start with the body. The Upanishad starts with awareness. You are aware, you are sentient, you are conscious. And what, what is presented to you, the waking consciousness? A body, senses, mind, and a world which you sense. We see, right now you are seeing. You hear, right now you are hearing. You taste and smell and touch. So that one consciousness flowing through the mind gives you sight, sound, smell, touch, taste. And when you look inward in the mind, there are thoughts, ideas, memories, desires. There is the ego which keeps on saying I. Uh, anger, desire, love, frustration, memory, the person. So this is what is presented to you. Are you with me? Is this not a description of our daily life. This is what we discover. There's a world out there and I am the waker experiencing the waker's world with my senses. And then next, the, the Upanishad says, you fall asleep and remember all this analysis is from the waker's point of view. Right now we are awake and we are looking at our experiences. And how would we describe it? We, I, the consciousness, I lose sight of my physical body that it is on a bed and sleeping, I completely forget it. And the mind generates in its own place, it generates a world, dream world. And I am in the dream world too. I have a body there and I am experiencing. I meet people, I go to places, I have good and bad experiences, good dreams and nightmares and so on. And all of that is generated by the mind. How do I know? Because when I wake up, I realize I'm on the, in the bed, it all happened in the mind. So that's the dream experience. And then that also shuts down. There's a different kind of sleeping called deep sleep. Vedanta has a unique take on deep sleep. Vedanta says you are not unconscious in deep sleep. You, the same consciousness, you've forgotten your body which is there on the bed, that's what we assume. The dream world disappears. There's just uniform blankness, darkness. We normally think of it as a, an unconscious state. But what Vedanta says is, it's not an unconscious state. 
you are still consciousness. But there is nothing for you to be conscious of. It's like you're driving up those hills in Sedona and you've got this uh, headlights of your car and in that you see so many things at night and when you come to the top of a hill the lights, the beams go out into the darkness of space and then you don't see the light also because there's nothing for the light to be reflected of. If there's mist or cloud you can see two beams of light but if it's an absolutely clear sky and when you're on the top of a hill the two beams of light go out there you know light is there. If you stopped the car and stepped in front of it, you would see in the blaze of illumination. But you don't see anything. It seems dark. Why? Because there is nothing to reflect the light from. Exactly like that in deep sleep, Advaita holds. You are still this consciousness. But it's not the waking state where you have body and senses to experience a world. It's not even a dream state where the mind generates dreams for you to experience. Consciousness alone remains without anything to experience, so it seems like nothing. There's not even the mind which will say, I am sleeping. If you think I'm sleeping, you're not sleeping. <laughs> you know, the, in India, sometimes mothers will check whether little kids are sleeping and they fake. You know, kids get hyperactive when it's bedtime. So, mother, the mother says, uh, the little boy, good little boy is uh, sleeping and if he's really asleep, then his left big toe will twitch. And if the left big toe twi twitches, the mother knows she, that the little boy is, f is faking it. If you are thinking I'm sleeping, then you are not sleeping. Even the mind shuts down. So there's no thought. That's why you don't feel that I am sleeping. It's a big claim. But there's a lot of, we can discuss it later also. Is there consciousness in deep sleep? I remember there was a conference on consciousness studies uh, in Calcutta, in one of our centers in Calcutta, it's called the Institute of Culture. And there were professors of philosophy, there were scient neuroscientists, there were monks, and there was an interesting discussion. But um, the philosophers of religion and, and uh, spirituality and the scientists couldn't come together on a definition of consciousness. They still haven't. But, <laughs> but one of the professors, who is a professor of Sankhya philosophy, is an American, Larson, Professor Larson. He asked a question to the neuroscientist, Doctor, in neuroscience, what is the definition of consciousness? Is there consciousness in deep sleep? And the doctor said, no, the way we define consciousness, there is no consciousness in deep sleep. It's an unconscious state. And the philosopher said, well, that's the difference. In Indian philosophy, there is only consciousness in deep sleep. There is no object of consciousness. Actually, you can see that they are coming from two different points of view. One is coming from an objective point of view, one is coming from a subjective point of view. Yeah. I remember one Swami giving a talk about this Mandukya in Calcutta University. And he says, then you go into the deep sleep, there is no world, there is no body, there is no mind, consciousness in itself without objects. That's how the Upanishad describes it. And one physiology professor could not take it anymore. He stood up in indignation and he said, what do you mean there is no world and body? You can see that the guy is sleeping on the bed and snoring. There's the body. From your point of view. But from the person's point of view, what is that person's experience? Think back about your deep sleep experience after waking up. Was it not a blankness? How do you prove that there is consciousness in deep sleep? I'll just touch upon this once and then go ahead. Um, Consider what it, it is like to be in deep sleep when you wake up and you look back upon it. In every culture in the world, there's a phrase like, I slept happily. You slept like a log? I didn't know it. I was out like a light. Every culture in the world has that. In the most ancient Sanskrit also it's there. Sukham maham aswapsam nakinchi davedisham. I slept happily. I did not know anything. Now, where does this come from? If there was no consciousness and no experience in deep sleep, supposing it was nothing, blank. In that case, you know what our report would be when we wake up? I went to sleep, I dreamt part of which I remember, and then I woke up. I would never report that there was a period when I didn't know anything. How do you know that? There was never, an, I didn't know anything. There was a period of blankness. It's like when I open my eyes, I see, 
And when I close my eyes, in a sense, I'm still seeing. Right? Your eyes are still, still working. Absolutely. In this, this is an example. In the same way, you can apply that to consciousness. When it, there's a world and a body to experience the world with, you are experiencing. When this is erased and there's a dream world, you're still experiencing. And when the dream world is erased, blankness, you're still experiencing blankness. So that awareness, waker and the waker's world, dreamer, the dreamer's world, and the deep sleeper and the deep sleeper's world, according to Vedanta, the claim is they all appear and shine and disappear in the light of one consciousness, which you are. So Vedanta says the real, the, the essential teaching of the Mandukya Upanishad is this, that we normally think of ourselves as the waker. Who am I? This guy, this body, this life. This is who I am. And that's different from me. That's the world. What Vedanta says, no, no, no. You are not the waker. You are not the dreamer. You are not the deep sleeper. They come and go in you. You are the consciousness alone. You are that pure consciousness. You are the fourth. Why fourth? Waker first. Dreamer second. Deep sleeper third. And fourth. The word in Sanskrit is? Turiya. Turiya yes. It's a common word understood in, um, not very common. You would have to be a little bit of a philosopher in India to have heard that word. But literally the word Turiya, in English T-U-R-I-Y-A, Turiya, it literally means the fourth. It just means number four. You are not the first, the waker. Normally we think we are the waker. Think about what it means. If I am consciousness in itself, and the waker, dreamer, and deep sleeper just the appearances in me, things appear in my light, in either light, and they disappear also. That light is constant. Then the waker and the waker's problems are not really my problems. I can exist without them. The dream and the nightmare are not really mine. They come and go. What happens in the movie doesn't stick to you. You are the watcher of the movie, not a player in the, in the movie itself. As long as you think you are a character in the movie, then it's a tragedy or a comedy for you. Yeah. <laughs> but when you are in the audience, it's all fun, entertainment, it's Hollywood. <laughs> I ask that when is a catastrophe, when is something horrible, a, a tragedy, an accident, a tragedy, when is it acceptable, when is it enjoyable? Only when it is Hollywood. When it is art, when it is fiction, when it is a movie, it's a painting, then alone. But if it is real, then you cannot say it's enjoyable, it's horrible. All disease, suffering, um, murder, whatever it is. If in some sense I am safe, in the audience you are safe, then you can enjoy the show. <coughs> this show is put up by consciousness which you are and consciousness is not harmed by it. Think about it. Forget the fourth, the pure consciousness. Well, don't forget it, but for the time being, set it aside. Even deep sleep. I give this example. A person in, say, New York and in Manhattan dying in, in Mount Sinai with a huge medical debt and about in an uh, intensive care unit, terrible problems, maybe alone, abandoned, whatever. When that person goes into deep sleep, what problem does that person have? <laughs> Nothing. From the waker's point of view, you will say, no, 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 it's just because he's forgotten it, how his problems have gone. But if you see it from the consciousness point of view, the waking world with its promises and problems comes roaring into your consciousness, occupies that space, the movie plays itself out, then disappears. Then comes the dream world with its own uh, experiences. That also goes. Then there's nothing, deep sleep. And this is repeated again and again in the light of that one consciousness which you are. What I'm saying is, you the consciousness in itself, the real consciousness, the fourth, is absolutely free of problems. And yet, you can inhabit this waking world and enjoy it to the fullest. The good things here, Sedona, and smoggy, this no longer smoggy, uh, <laughs> LA, or whatever it is, the good and the bad, all of them. And you can live a full life 
in your waking world, in your waking incarnation also, with joy and fearlessly so. Because you are ultimately not trapped in this. You are absolutely independent of it. Okay, let me go ahead one more point and then I still have not come to Om. Okay. <laughs> one more point. When we say fourth, it does not mean there are actually four consciousnesses. There is only one consciousness which appears as three. Do we, we already see some of that, right? Waking, dreaming, deep sleep are not three different persons apart from you. They are you, but they are appearances in you. You are not trapped in any of them. So, and a good example, very good example which I often use is gold and ornaments. Suppose there is gold and it is made into a necklace. Then it is melted and made into a ring. Then it is melted and made into a bracelet. Now necklace, ring, bracelet. One, two, three. They are different. They look different. Their names are different. Necklace, ring, bracelet. And they are used in different parts of the body. Necklace, ring, bracelet. And yet, isn't it the same thing? The same gold? Right? It's the same gold. It was made into these three forms. And the gold in itself is neither a necklace, nor a ring, nor a bracelet. But it is the reality of the necklace, reality of the ring, reality of the bracelet. Is it not? Now, this is an example. You'd say, so what? The, uh, the conclusion is this. Vedanta says, or the Mandukya Upanishad claims, you are that one consciousness, just like the gold, which is now fashioned into the waker and the waker's world. Then again melted back into and fashioned into the dreamer and the dreamer's world. And then melted back into a lump of featurelessness <coughs> called the deep sleep. But in and through waker, dreamer and deep sleeper is one awareness. So the fourth is not separate from the waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. It is in, it is in and through the waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. Just like gold is in and through the ne necklace, bracelet and the ring. Right? Why is this important? Because when people hear the fourth, something apart from waker, dreamer, deep sleeper, immediately the conclusion is, then there must be, this is not the truth right now. There is something else called the fourth which I have to attain, then only I have attained illumination. It's like saying, oh, the necklace is not the truth. I've just been told the truth is something called gold. Throw away the necklace. Let me search for gold. You'll never find it. You just threw it away. <laughs> the absolute, call it God, Brahman, whatever you call it, the light of pure awareness, the Buddhists have a beautiful term, the clear light of the void. Uh, whatever you call it, it's available fully, completely, right here, right now. You are it. Just as the gold is fully available. Where? In the necklace. Or when it is a ring, or when it is a bracelet, it is the gold. But you have to know the gold as gold. A good story which Sri Ramakrishna used to tell, very beautiful story. It's the story of the washerman who found a diamond. The story is, in India, you have to see the Indian context, where until very recently we didn't have washing machines for uh, the clothes washing or dryers. So there would be these people, a lot of such people who are washermen and washerwomen. They'll come up and pick your clothes from your house and then they take it to the riverside and then they wash it. You wouldn't want to know what they do to the clothes, the way they thrash it on the <laughs> rocks. And, but they really make it clean and they spread it out on the rocks and dry it and they scrub it. And so this washerman found a stone, a shiny stone and thought it was a nice rock to scrub the clothes with. Actually it was a huge diamond but he didn't know what a diamond was. So he scrubbed clothes until one day he thought this is a weird rock. Let me ask my friend who is a vegetable seller who knows a little more than me. So he goes to the vegetable seller. What do you think this, this is? How much will you give me for it? And the vegetable seller said, oh, this is not an ordinary rock. It's quite a pretty rock. And I will give you 10 rupees for it. Even he didn't know what a diamond was, but he thought it's, a, it's something nice. Luckily, the washerman thought, let me ask somebody more knowledgeable than him. So the, whoever he went to, each of them gave a higher valuation of that. Until he came to the diamond merchant, who said, my God, where did you find this? This is the most magnificent diamond I have ever seen or heard of. 
I will give you 10 million rupees for it. And so the washerman was immediately um, rich and all his troubles were over. Now the point of the story is, all along he had this most magnificent diamond with him. And he didn't know it. He used it for scrubbing st uh, clothes. The point is, we have the absolute. Right now, we are it. But we don't know it. What do we use it for? We use it for seeing and hearing, consciousness, smelling and tasting and touching, fighting and desiring and, and hurting and, uh, and feeling miserable and committing suicide. And uh, That's what we use consciousness for, like scrubbing clothes with the diamond. We don't know what it is, what we have got here. The key to salvation is right in our hands, right now, right, all the time. It's right there. I always used to think, let people put a price on things, but the greatest thing in the world should always be free and always available. And the fact is, it is. That's what makes it ultimately a just world. The greatest thing that your awareness, this consciousness, this immortal awareness which we are, it's continuously available to us all the time. Just like the sunlight and the air and the water, like that, much more than that, the most important thing is this awareness is continuously available to us. The fourth is something that we already are. The three are manifestations of that fourth, waking, dreaming, deep sleeping. But why are they important, waking, dreaming, deep sleeping? Because they are doorways to this realization. Why is the necklace important or the bracelet or the ring? Because with that you can realize what gold is. You need a name and a form. All right. Done. Now we go into Om. <laughs> you might have a question that, all right, it's very good. Now what do I do? How do I get this? In Sanskrit, it's called Brahma Jnana, the realization of Brahman, the enlightenment. How do I get this? Traditional religion or yogic approaches, it would be a lifelong process of, uh, of devotion and worship. And yogic processes would be a lifelong effort of concentrated meditation and so on and so forth. All of which are good. Vedanta does not dispense with anything. All of them Vedanta sees as useful and helpful for uh, ultimate enlightenment. But Vedanta gives direct methods. And one of the most powerful direct methods is Om. Here is how it works. In the Mandukya Upanishad, after explaining these, half of the Mandukya Upanishad is what I just said. The other half is what I'm going to tell you now about Om. It's a method uh, which you can apply to come to this enlightening moment. What's the method? Mandukya says, you, the waker, and your entire waking world is an appearance in consciousness. Give this experience, what you're having now, give this experience a name. You see, it says, Om has four aspects. Om has four aspects. What are the four aspects of Om? It literally says four letters of Om. What are they? Uh, in English, we say A-U-M, and then silence after that. In Sanskrit, the clo actually A-U-M is the closest we can get. In Sanskrit, A U M Ma A U Ma. If you combine them together, you get not Aum. <laughs> a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Before you knew this, you were pronouncing it correctly. You were saying Om. The <laughs> moment you say Aha, it is A U Ma or A U M. So it must be Aum. Now I know more. No, it's wrong. The rules of Sanskrit grammar say when you put A and U together, it becomes O. O. So, when the M mm comes after that, correct pronunciation is OM. Correct. You had it right the first time around. <laughs> but if you analyze that, split it apart, you get A, U, M. Mm. The closest we get in Sanskrit is, in English is A, U, M. But luckily, fortunately, when you write it as O, M in English, that's actually the correct pronunciation. OM is the correct pronunciation. After that comes silence. So when you say Om, silence. A, U, M, silence. These are four, three letters and one silence after that, four. 
Some of you might be going, wait a minute, the fourth, we just saw, when you experience, you look at your own experience, doesn't it have four aspects? Waking, dreaming, deep sleeping, and the real consciousness in which all three are experienced, the consciousness itself. Four aspects, four aspects of yourself, four letters of Om. You say, hmm, can I match them? Yes, the Upanishad says that's what you have to do. Match them, map them. How do you map it? Here is the process. You, the waker, and your entire waking experience, name it A, uh, the first letter of O. You, the, the dreamer, and your dreams, which dreams? Our dreams. Name it U, the second letter. Name it means associate in your mind. That's the name of dream. Whose dreams? All dreams. You, the consciousness. And the deep sleep, silence, and darkness, give it the name M. M. And you, the real consciousness, the gold in the three ornaments, name it the silence. It's the silence after Om. Now you have the beginning of Om as waker and waker's world. Dreamer and the dream world. Deep sleeper and the deep sleep world. And beyond that, the silence. But remember, that silence and you, the fourth, the, the consciousness in itself, that silence is not the silence opposed to noise. Here, there is noise and here, there is silence. But that silence which Om sp that we speak about is the silence underlying noise also. <laughs> it's a continuous silence. Rather, what is meant is the consciousness in which the silence is experienced. Experience the silence and go back from the silence to awareness. In places like this, you can easily do it actually. <coughs> like Sedona, for example. So, A, uh, waking. U, dreaming. M, mm, deep sleep. You don't have to wake, dream or go into deep sleep. In the waking world itself, just simulate it. Sit quietly with eyes closed. When you go, when you go through Om, chant the whole Om. Okay, here's another thing. I'm now practicing the waking world. I go, ah, uh, no, don't do that. That's silly. <laughs> chant the whole Om. Just know that it stands for waking, dreaming, deep sleeping. So when you drag it out, Om, cycle in your mind through your entire waking life, the person you experience yourself as. Then some hypothetical <coughs> dream maybe, how it is like to be in dreams as you go through the oo, and as you come into the mm, cycle, uh, g simulate in your mind, what is it like to be in deep sleep? And as you fade away into silence, be, know that you are the one consciousness in which all three appear and disappear. Try it now, let's see. I will chant, you chant with me three times, then the next time, I will chant three times. You don't chant with me. You just keep remembering waking, you the waker, your dreams, your deep sleep, and the awareness in which all three come and go. First chant together, and then listen to me chanting it three times. If you feel like, you can sit up straight, not rigid, relaxed, but alert. Relaxed, alert. Good, good instruction is, be relaxed, don't move, be alert. Relaxed, no movement, be alert. One Swami who sounded like a, what you might call a boot camp instructor in the, in the Himalayas, <laughs> is giving instructions for meditation, but effective, a little rough, but effective. He sh it barks at the people sitting there. In Hindi, I'll tell, translate it into English. He's, he, he barks at them, hilo mat, bolo mat, socho mat. <laughs> what does it mean? Don't move. And everybody sort of freezes. <laughs> Don't speak. Okay. Don't think. <laughs> Don't move. Don't speak. Don't think. And each of those has very deep implications. Even the instruction not to move. Right. It takes a long time to settle down into it. Speaking. It's not just with tongue. With the mind. It chatters away. Don't speak. From there to don't think, that's a big thing. We are compulsive thinkers, obsessive thinkers. Yeah. All right. So sit straight, don't move, 
but alert. If you like, you can close your eyes. Chant with me. Oh. Oh. I will chant Om three times, listen and intensely imagine your waking self, your dream experience, deep sleep and in the silence you are the one awareness. Listen and simulate it, simulate it within yourself. Om Silence You are the consciousness in which silence is experienced. You are the consciousness in which always experienced the waking. You are the awareness in which U is experienced the dreaming. You are the awareness in which deep sleep mm, is experienced. And in and of itself your name is silence. Oh. Silence, witness consciousness. Once more. When you are comfortable, slowly open your eyes. Yeah, not so fast. Enlightenment. <laughs> yes, it'll happen. It'll come. It's good to listen to these things. All right, let's discuss it. Your questions, observations, anything to do with not only just the Mandukya or Om, but also Indian philosophy in general, spirituality in general. I'll see what I can say. Yes. You're using awareness and consciousness as the same. Right. The, in, uh, the Sanskrit word, the, the number of words for that, chit, Chaitanya, Turiya is one word for that. I am using it in a general sense. That's why I keep switching between awareness, consciousness, even sentience. Uh, um, because the English words are ambiguous. That's why I tend to use a number of words for uh, what I mean. I mean something very specific. It's there. It's very real. It's now. It's here. It's you. There's no doubt about it. But I'm using different words to point to it.
consciousness studies is a big thing now. It's interesting, we are at, at that point in uh, science and civilization in the last 20 years or so. Before that, scientists were not interested. Now they are interested in consciousness. Yes. What about some of the things that they are doing where they're talking about making AIs and using the brain? Mm -hmm. Yes. There's a lot of discussion going on now. And I have come to know some of the people. I had read their papers and books earlier, but now I see um, some of the best philosophy departments are in New York, in Manhattan. So, for example, David Chalmers. He is the one who coined the term, the hard problem of consciousness. And I was amazed to find him in the, in the New York University. He is the head of the mind-brain consciousness unit there. And there are others. So there's a whole range of uh, views on consciousness right now. But they're seriously discussing it. Um, so one topic which has come up now, pe because people are interested in AI now, in artificial brains now. So art an artificially intelligent machine, a brain, would it be conscious? Would it be conscious in the sense I'm talking about? But that's a little debatable, a little difficult to say. But one thing is very Vedantic there. You could have a machine which is intelligent without being conscious. Mm -hmm. Clearly showing what Vedanta, again and again, this point it makes, that mind and consciousness are not the same thing. Mind, memory, thinking, intelligence. You could have a machine do all of that. Just like you use a machine as a forklift to lift heavy weights. You don't need a living body to do that. Similarly, you don't even need a living brain to get, have intelligence. You might even have a machine. Nowadays machines are so intelligent. One of my hosts in Denver, the little girl, she speaks equally to her mom and to Google. She carries on these conversations with Google, happily. Now you could have a brain, an artificial brain which mimics uh, uh, us and to all purposes from externally it is intelligent it does intelligent things but it's not conscious no more than if you want a water faucet to be turned on and you ask me and I turned it on I consciously turned it on but there's a sensor you put your hand in front of it and water comes out there's no consciousness behind it in um, California now this they're trying out the Google car different places so already had its first accident also, I think. <laughs> but anyway, when you are driving and this driverless car pulls up beside you, from a distance, if you see the two behavior of the two vehicles, they seem same. You, but there's a big, there's a world of difference between the two. What's the difference? In your car, you are there driving. You are having a conscious experience of sight, sound, smell, touch, decision making. All of that is shining in your awareness. All of that is going on there in that Google car also, but without that awareness. It is happening. Not even the most ambitious Google engineer will say that his invention is conscious. <laughs> they might claim that it is intelligent. And there are tests for it. Turing test is there and so on to test whether it is really intelligent or not. So. Something could be intelligent, there could be artificial intelligence without consciousness. What makes, all right, I'll stop at that. Yes. Uh, isn't another word for awareness soul, so that intelligent apparatus robot has no soul? Right. And that's the difference? Correct. In fact, the English word soul is ambiguous. In Sanskrit, you have precise words for these things. Why is it ambiguous? In English, when you say soul, look at the way you use the word soul. She is a good soul. Meaning that person is kind and generous and nice and polite, which are characteristics of the personality, of the mind. Another way you use the word soul is my immortal soul. We are talking about what you might call the spiritual soul. In Vedanta, clear distinction is made between physical body, which is called a gross body, gross not in the sense of being gross, but it can be pretty gross, but in the sense of being physical, which you can see, touch, smell, taste, uh, this, this thing, gross body. And inside this, there's something called the subtle body, in Sanskrit, sukshma sharira, subtle body. And beyond that is you, the consciousness. When you are awake in this body, you are consciousness plus subtle body plus this gross body. 
When you are in dreams, you are consciousness with the subtle body. We are in deep sleep, consciousness enveloped in darkness. There is something else called the causal body, I am not going into that. So the soul, yes, one sense of the word soul is this. And according to Advaita, what is this soul? What is this, what we call the immortal soul, spirit, whatever you call it? It is awareness. We have it all the time. It's the diamond in the hand of the washerman. That consciousness, it's immortal. What do you mean immortal? The body dies. What was born? The body was born. What ages? The body ages. What gets diseased? The body. Even the mind might get diseased. What dies? The body dies. What transmigrates you know, from life to life? It's the mind which transmigrates. Consciousness is one and unchanging, according to Advaita Vedanta. Advaita has many of these pointers. Something available to us all the time, but we don't catch it. So uh, Advaita, uh, the Advaita Vedanta continuously tries to direct our attention to it. It's available to us, but we don't see it. Just like the gold is available in the ornament. And if someone keeps saying, yeah, I see a necklace, what do you mean gold? What's gold? You melt it down, necklace is gone. No, it's not gone. The, the, the thing is still there, it's gold. So, like that, the absolute spirit, consciousness, whatever you call it, it's continuously available to us all the time. Can yes? you talk about the difference between awareness and form? I know people who study the Vedanta and they don't think that the form is important. Right. And I feel the opposite, the both important. Um, what is this experience? According to Vedanta, it is awareness with name and form. And what's the necklace? It's gold with name and form. One more step would be name, form and utility. In Sanskrit, Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara. So, gold is the reality. Its name is necklace. Its form is like this and its utility is you put it here. Now, why Vedanta does not give importance, so much importance to form? Why does it make it secondary? There is a reason. The reason is this. Notice what happens when you take the gold and make it into a necklace, melt it down, make it into a bracelet, melt it down, make it into a ring. What keeps changing? Form, name, even the use. What's constant? The gold. In the same way, in our lives, what keeps changing? Our waking life keeps changing. It's full of change. And then the whole waking life goes away. And there's a dream life. That's also full of change. And then the whole thing goes away. And there's the deep sleep. There's no, there's, there's no apparent change there. And then it goes away. The whole thing goes away and the waking life comes roaring in. <coughs> but what's constant there? It is consciousness. Now, the necklace or the bracelet or the ring have no existence apart from the gold. Are you with me here? Every bit of that necklace is gold. If you take the gold away, so, you know, they say that, uh, and the value of that is gold. I was in Manhattan when I said that. Somebody said, oh, you don't know, go to Tiffany's. The value is not the gold, value is the, is the name, the brand. <laughs> uh, Tiffany. No. You know why? Because if I go to Tiffany and say, oh, the value is the brand, uh, okay, fine. I don't care for your brand, keep the necklace, I'll take the gold away. <laughs> <laughs> Won't work. The brand and the necklace and the form and all the glory of the Tiffany's brand or whatever it is, it depends on the gold. Without the gold, nothing. Uh, I'll come to you. So, yes, in our day-to-day -day life, name and form and use are paramount importance. And the... In the, and that's called Vyavaharika. So that's, they, they say in samsara, in maya, all of this is of paramount importance. But immortality, salvation, realization lies in noticing what's underneath. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, it's like seeing a movie and becoming a player in the movie, then you are trapped in the movie. But if you see the movie as a movie, then you're all right. Let the movies come and go. You don't have to switch up the movie. The yogi says, switch up the movie in deep samadhi, nirvikalpa samadhi, asampragyata samadhi, the truth will be revealed to you. You want to see the screen, switch up the movie. Vedanta says, let the movie play, the movie is fun. <laughs> you are the screen, unaffected by the movie, a terrible firestorm in the movie. The screen doesn't burn, 
The greatest of floods comes, earthquake comes on the movie. The screen is not split or, wet or drenched by the flood. Nothing happens to it. It's perfectly safe. Not only is the screen safe, it makes the movie possible. Not only are you safe, safe means you are immortal, but you make this experience possible. You are the gold in the ornament. You are the screen in the, of the movie. I remember, um, hold on to your question, I'll come to you. I remember once I was in the Himalayas and uh, I was studying non-dual Vedanta under this Swami who is to live in a little ashram there, a little center. Um, how am I doing for time? How much time do we have? Okay. <laughs> and this Swami, he had never seen, he teaches this kind of philosophy. But uh, he's, he used to meditate in a cave. He used to uh, he'll tell us that the only sin I've ever committed in my life is starting this ashram, this center. I was happier in the cave. But then we would say, but, but then we all benefit from the center. People can come and meet you because of the center. So he would say to us, he, he told me a story. Not me personally, but everybody who was there. Um, he had never seen a television. So a television crew came there. That's the origin of the river Ganga. You know, it's holy for Hindus, uh, all Indians, in fact. Uh, that's, a, that's the source. So a television crew came there to film it and the beautiful scenery of the Himalayas. And because the Swami had not seen television, so they rigged up a set in front of him. They put the camera towards the river and spun up a generator to power the television. And, sh and the Swami told us, uh, he was delighted like a little boy. He was in his 80s. Then. Uh, he told us, I'll tell you in Hindi, it's very sweet. Those, uh, then I'll translate. He said, Mahatmaji, sab dikha. Oh, monks, everything could be seen in that box. The river was there. The gurgling sound of the river was there. Uh, kal kal karti hui pani, he said. Uh, everything was there. And I said to the TV crew, uh, in Hindi, he said, Babu, ek gilas ganga pani do. <laughs> my my, my uh, uh, dear sir, can you give me a glass of holy ganga water from, this, from that? <laughs> and then the... Then the TV director said, Oh, Swami, there's nothing there. It just looks like that, sounds like it, looks like that, but it's not there. Having said that, the monk turned to us and said, So, monks, do you understand? My, uh, my dear monks, do you understand? All this, it appears. There's nothing real here. You are the only reality. In Hindi, he said, Ye sab dikhti hai. That means it, it was like something like this, towering. It was uh, about 11,000 feet high, and you could see. It. And that's like low in the Himalayas. Uh, it was surrounded by the real giants, which are 18, 19, 20, 21,000 feet. I was in Colorado, the Rockies, just two days ago, and I was at 14,000 feet. And one gentleman there said, oh, you come from India, but you're the Him Himalayas. These are our b tallest mountains, but these are babies compared to what you have got there. <laughs> yes, because... It goes all the way up to Everest, which is 29,000 feet. Of, you know, so the Swami said, all of this, it appears. You can see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it. It's not real. What is real? The consciousness in which you are experiencing all of this. That consciousness appears in these five modes. Hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, seeing. Yeah. So where is the consciousness in that? And <clears throat> in that state, um, isn't it possible the body can be harmed? Oh, even if the body is harmed, it's, you are not the body. The body is part of the movie. <clears throat> our general, you know, our framework, because we have been brought up in this way, our framework is, I am a body in which consciousness is generated. So I'm like a computer running a program. But what Vedanta does is, it reverses that. You are consciousness in which a body appears, is used, and it dies and goes away. You are untouched. You need not be afraid. Suppose someone comes and kills the body, you would not be harmed in the least. It's like someone melting the, um, the necklace. Necklace is gone, so what? You are the gold, you wear the gold, you are the gold now. Earlier you were a necklace, now you are a lump of gold. The name has changed, the form has changed. You are exactly the same. 
There's a beautiful uh, analogy which Vedanta teachers use. It's about the ocean. A little wave races along the Pacific Ocean. It's born there. And it's having a nice time. It has got little wave friends. And <laughs> some of them are friendly to it. And some of, but then problems come. Some of the waves are mean to it, as little waves will be to others. And some waves are huge. And it feels like a, I'm nobody compared to that. Look at that, a tsunami wave. My God, I'll never reach that. You know, Jeff Bezos, multi-billionaire, he just <laughs> crossed into, I saw Time magazine, it says he crossed over, the first person in history to cross over $100 billion in um, uh, personal wealth. It's a tsunami wave, I'll never be like that. And then little wave looks at a bubble maybe and says, what a loser. I'm, I'm <laughs> so much b bigger than him or, or that little thing. <laughs> and envy and jealousy and friendship and enmity, all of those are there. That's called samsara, wave samsara. But the biggest problem of all comes when the wave sees the shore rushing up you know, and asks, what's that? You see, that's California. <laughs> What's happening to all the waves? They smash against it and they die. Huh. I'm going to die too? Yeah. That's the, that's, the, that's the end of all waves. You hit the shore and you burst into spray and that's it. How horrible. And luckily for it, along comes a Vedantic wave maybe. A, a, spiritual, a spiritual wave. And says, look, all this is true, but there's a deeper truth. What is that? There is something called water. There is something called water. It does not die. It changes forms, but it does not die. Really? Yes, it is the same everywhere. Really? That's great, but good for water. But what about me? I'm going to die. <laughs> there is water in you. Really? Yes, you are actually water. Where? Where? <laughs> well, first, look deep within you. And you will find water. And then next, look at your surface, you'll find water. Look in between, you'll find water. In fact, you'll find water all around. And once you realize that, you'll realize that you are water racing towards the shore. When you smash against the shore, you lose the wave form, but you're still water in million drops of spray, uh, spray and foam. You rise up to the sky in vapor, you're still water. You'll come back as rain, you're still water, right? You are that, that immortal thing called water, not only that, another amazing thing happens. The moment, uh, somebody's phone is on. <laughs> yeah. The moment you realize that you are water, another thing happens is that everybody nearby, all the other waves, you realize they are water too. And you are not, you are not water in that one little wave. You are water in all the waves. The moment you realize you are water, you don't think I am water as a little wave. You become limitless. You become the entire Pacific Ocean. Uh, tell me, which is more powerful, wave or water? water? Water, because the wave cannot exist without the water. Its very existence, all its power is drawn from the water. Which is more powerful, wave or ocean? Ocean, much vaster. The wave is a tiny part of the ocean. But which is more powerful, water or ocean? Water. Because the ocean is nothing but water. Now in the Vedantic scheme of things, a little wave is us, us individual beings. The ocean is God. The Vedantic idea of God is the totality. But the water is, is Brahman, the absolute, which you are. The little person and the totality, God and the universe, they all depend upon you. Not you as the person. The person comes and goes. Yeah. Yes. Isn't the problem really our identification with it? Absolutely. Here is the crucial thing. Only one thing you need to know. That's a beautiful way of stating Vedanta. Our identification right now is, I am a body with consciousness. You change it, reverse it. You are consciousness with a body, consciousness aware of a body, of a body functioning and appearing in consciousness. And I'll tell you something, if you are honestly take a look at your experience right now, forget the categories of enlightened, not enlightened, I am a poor little being, uh, forget those categories. Just look at your experience right now. How are you experiencing the world 
as a body with consciousness or are you experiencing yourself as a consciousness in which a body appears? Tell me the truth. You look at, t look, tell yourself the truth. Look at your experience right now. Doesn't your body appear in your awareness? If you were the body, then in dreams, you know what would happen? Your experience would be, I am lying on the bed. <laughs> you could not continue to experience yourself in a dream world, having dream experiences, completely forgetting, without reference to the body of the waking self. Which shows, in principle at least, even a materialist cannot deny this, that a conscious experience can continue without subjective reference to the body. That much at least, in a very cautious way I am putting it. Don't forget your question, hold on to that. So yes, Advaita Vedanta is, as you said, it's a shifting of the reference of I. Reference of I means, words have things they refer to. Cloth is a word, this is the thing. Cloth is the word referring to this thing. Yeah. Picture is a word referring to that thing. Chair is a word. Thing. <coughs> now, I is a word, the vertical I, not this one. The vertical I is a word. It refers to what? The body? That's what we normally think. Vedanta says, no. It refers to you, the awareness. In which the body also appears and disappears. The body appears every day when you wake up and disappears and there is a dream body which appears in dreams and disappears and there is no body which appears in deep sleep. Right? Shift the reference. I does not mean body. I means awareness. And now apply it to every problem that you face in life. You will see every problem is a problem in the world outside or the problem in the body or problem in the mind. A waking problem, a dream problem, and the seed of all problems in deep sleep, because it comes back. But there is no problem at all. Disease, death, poverty, yeah. unhappiness, misery, depression, no problem at all associated with consciousness as such. Every problem is an object for consciousness, is not in consciousness. It does not belong to consciousness. It comes and goes, like motes of dust in bright sunlight. They float and disappear. When you realize, when you shift your awareness to the I, when you shift your awareness to the I as consciousness, everything that appears in consciousness you will welcome with a namaste, give it a cup of tea as long as you are there, <laughs> and when it goes, you will say namaste, goodbye, nice meeting you. Swamiji, one yes. more question. Yes. Um, this is full of many maybe perhaps contradiction or confusion, but in this day and age, um, I, I see there's a lot of, uh, we, we talked about AI, huh. and um, I wonder if, if we're all one consciousness, we talked about I and I realizing my consciousness, huh. but if we're all one consciousness, um, can I realize for another their consciousness? I know that there's a story about um, I think it was uh, Sharadama saying that if I do it for you, that's enough. Or right. Um, but the reason I ask this question is based on a movie that's uh, a book and a movie called Ready Player One. Oh. Where um, It's about video games? Yeah. It's about the world falling apart based on what a, the visible world falling apart and the escape into a virtual world mm -hmm. and living your life in that virtual world. So my concern is coming out of that where when does one come to that question mm -hmm. that I want to realize and I'm afraid for those I care about that they won't come to that question. Of course, they have many lives according to us, but um, to do that. But when can I realize for another or can I help? Another? All right. I split your question into three parts. One is can I realize for another? Second is um, that the question of um, you know, when does one come to this realization? And third is your concern for others. You know, you're, you're afraid for others. First is, can I realize for another, if you are one consciousness? Remember, we are one consciousness, but different in bodies and minds. Those bodies and minds are also in consciousness, but they are not the same. In consciousness, clearly. In Ved one way Vedanta works beautifully is, if you stick very closely to what you are experiencing, do we experience one body or many bodies? Many bodies, clear. 
Do we experience one mind or many minds? Many minds, clearly. Each mind is unique and different. Now, where is spiritual realization? Is it in the consciousness or in the mind? It's in the mind. That's why when we speak about an enlightened person and a person who is not yet enlightened, where is the difference? If they are one consciousness, they are one consciousness. But the difference is, this mind does not understand and that mind understands, has got it. Not understanding in an intellectual way, but actually clarity is there. It's absolutely clear. Daylight for that person. So the difference is in the mind. You may realize it in your own mind, but those around you may not realize it. You can help the other, but your realization is not the realization of another person. Otherwise, when the Buddha becomes enlightened, we would have all become enlightened. When Ramakrishna or Vivekananda or Ramana Maharshi or Christ or anybody becomes enlightened, we are all enlightened then. No, it doesn't work that way. It hasn't. Obviously, it doesn't. Till now, it has not happened that way. But they can help us. The Mandukya Upanishad helps us. Uh, the teachings of the great spiritual masters in all religions, they are helping us. In fact, a place like this exists, Sidona, because of the, that uh, inherited heritage of spiritual knowledge. So that's help. Second, you're afraid for those around you. That's your concern and it's very good. But remember, ultimately they are safe. They are all ultimately safe. But if you want to lessen their suffering, you have to work hard for, to help them in various ways. Transmission of spiritual knowledge, but also service. Yeah. Medicine for the sick, education for the illiterate. Yeah. So service. Vivekananda strongly emphasized service. If you're enlightened, what will you do? Just sit with a shiny face? <laughs> <laughs> no. When you realize, I am the water in all the waves and the spray and the bubbles everywhere. I am that one water. They're all in me. Immediately, that wave, as long as it is there, it becomes, lives a life of wavy service. So, yeah. So, that, that's the answer. All right. We are out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed this session and the beautiful questions too.